my guest today uh, is a dear friend whom I've never met. I have a few of those throughout the country. Her name is Debbie Tibbles, and she is an author. She is a powerful, strong, intelligent, beautiful, capable woman who has recently transformed her life yet again. I follow her on Facebook, and we stay in touch. We've known each other, we figure, at least uh, a little over a decade. So um, we've never met, as I said, but I'm super excited to have her here today. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited oh, to have you here. Thank you, Debbie. Oh, well, thank you for having me. And uh, it's really nice to see you again, not kind of see you again, but yeah, it's, it's well, good. We're going to meet during the next tour that was canceled this year, but next spring we'll be in Chicago. We've already talked about this, so we'll get to. Yeah, I know. I'm super excited. I can't wait to actually meet you in person and I'm probably going to give you a really ginormous hug. Yes. Well. Okay. <laughs> we hope so yeah yes thank you for being here there are so many layers to your story that i want to share with um with our audience today and some of them are the triumphant things that that are exciting and happy and others are just like the the hell on earth that some of us live through and you lost your son 16 years ago yes i can't believe it's been that long you know i mean some days it feels like it is that long and in other days it's like wow uh, like just like it just happened so you and know you wrote a book and that's how we met each other we were put in yeah. touch by a mutual friend john st augustine whom i've also had on the show and i have met and <laughs> he, um he you know you the way you guys met is very interesting as well that we'll share but but you wrote a beautiful book and as I read it, it's Ollie Tibbles, the yes. boy who became a train. That's right. And as I read that book, I, it was kind of when texting first started and I was texting you the whole time as I read it. It was so compelling and you were so raw and honest about the journey of losing your son and fighting for his life and then letting his life go. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about who Ollie was and how old he was and, and what he was like. Well, um, so Ollie was, um, first of all, absolutely mad about trains. Um, ever since he was, uh, you know, could open a book, it was always about trains. So that was one thing. And I know a lot of kids do love, you know, trains and all the rest of it, but he, I don't know, there was something about it. There was just like, it was just a little bit more. Um, and I can remember when he was, um, when he was four years old, I actually have two older children. And I had asked him what I had, had asked my other children, you know, so what do you want to be when you grow up, Ollie, you know? And uh, he looked at me and he said, well, um, you know, in this perfect little clipped English accent, you know, he said, well, I'm going to be a train. And of course I thought he got that completely wrong. And I said, well, you mean you're going to be a train driver, right, Ollie? And he said, no, I'm going to be a train mummy. And he was like, so like, this is what's going to happen. Well, it, that's, quite profound when you think about it because and this was when he was four uh, my son passed away when he was seven and a year later metro railways named their latest locomotive engine 401 uh, they named it after my son uh, on the side of the engine it actually reads oliver ollie because that's how he was always known everybody just knew him as ollie tibbles um and the way that the reason why the book became Ollie Tibbles, the boy who became a train, is because it's kind of what he is. And he is spreading this message of love and hope and courage and inspiration to, to everybody that boards that train. And because he was, he was a fighter, he was incredibly kind um, and like an old soul, like a wise soul. Like he knew that he was dying you know, um, and yet somehow, he fighter, and he was a fighter. He was an absolute fighter. I mean, you know, some of the things that my son had to endure, I mean, we've now advanced so much in, uh, in research and therapies that, uh, you know, but he's from, from, from kind of like the old school of therapy where, um, uh, it, it, it was very, very taxing on his body physically. And so he suffered a great deal. I mean, it, and it was horrendous to watch as a mother, as a, you know, the whole family, um, and yet somehow it, he was always thinking about other people. You know, he was always concerned about how I was feeling, you know, not to t and telling me not to worry, you know, it's going to be okay, mommy, it's going to be okay. Um, but that's how he was, 
and the book really captures the spirit of Ollie um, and also the and, and also how that came to be. You know, I, I didn't go and ask Metra, hey, can you name your a train after my son? Because, you know, he just loves trains. So that was all about synchronistic kind of um, situations occurring. I started journaling. I just started journaling. And this was like you were talking earlier about texting back in the day. Uh, you know, the social media w was really non-existent. We didn't have Facebook then. And so everything was like email and, and the texting and the instant messaging. And I started sharing my journal as I wrote it. I started sending it out into the universe, just out to everybody that I knew because it was just, yeah. okay. you know, something that I needed to do. And, and then the magic happened in that people started forwarding the chapters as I was writing them, you know, this journal, uh, people started sharing it with other people. I mean, like not just here in the United States, but I was getting emails from people from across the world that, that was reading my journal as I was writing it. Things that happen organically like that. You couldn't have planned I, Debbie. You couldn't have. Seriously. Tried it, I, it worked. I know. And, that, and that's actually how I ended up on Oprah Radio and meeting John, our mutual friend, um, through the Make-A-Wish Foundation, where um, I had I was asked to be the guest speaker and just to share my story um, about Oli and uh, how, as a parent, you, I don't want to say overcome the loss of a child, because I don't feel like that is, because it's something that you just, it's something you learn to just live with. And I feel very strongly that, you know, it's, it's, it's either going to break you or make you, or you can use it in a way that is, 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 is a positive light. And I, for me, it was never going to be um, a negative thing because Ollie wasn't negative. He was this beautiful child with so much uh, love and light for everybody that he knew. Um, it would be dishonorable to, to have his memory tainted by, uh, you know, just, sadness and um pity and and and, and that. that's just not how he is it just wasn't how he is and it still isn't how he is so so it just it was a natural when you spoke, when you spoke at the uh sorry i we had a little delay there i didn't mean to interrupt you when we spoke when you spoke at the make a wish grand ball mm -hmm. he had already passed yes and your story had made it through all these different channels and you mm -hmm. now were invited to speak yeah, John who was in the audience, and yeah. he was then producing Oprah Radio and invited you to come on the show. Yeah, and had the book happened yet? No, and and actually, and and you know, here's the other thing. Again, when we talk about how the universe conspires to do certain things, which I I'm just a huge believer in. Um, I had actually I had come to what I considered not the end of the journal, but I had stopped writing for a while. I felt I felt there was something missing, and I didn't know what it was. I, I truly didn't know what that was. I just knew that uh, it wasn't ready to, I had offers of publishing and I wasn't ready to do it yet. And I had this, and I felt like the answer was going to be, uh, it was all around the, the ball and I don't know why. Uh, so anyway, I go, I go to the ball and uh, I make this speech and I was scheduled to speak. And I remember we had a rehearsal and I was told that I had 19 minutes and 25 seconds to make my speech, okay? And I, because somebody else was coming no up. No pressure, no yeah. pressure. No, right, exactly. And so anyway, so I had this all timed. Well, on the night in question, um, you know, I go up and I was so, I was absolutely petrified. I used 900 people there. I'd never spoken in public like that before. And so I get up and I'd had a few glasses of wine, thank God, because I don't think I would have done it otherwise. But anyway, I got up and um, I started talking. I ended up talking for 44 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it was- Were they waving you off or no? They were, just, they were just taken in by you. It was, it just, it was okay. Every, it was just, I actually, uh, I, yeah, it was amazing. I got a, a it just people were just very, very gracious at the end of the speech. There was a standing ovation. Yeah, standing ovation, yes. It was, it was amazing. But that was, but really, what the truly amazing thing wasn't even that. It, it really wasn't. It was at the end of it. Um, as I'm, I'm, you know, I'm crying, and it's just very emotional. And uh, anyway, the chairman of Metro Railways, because because the Make a Wish Grand Ball that year was actually held at Union Station in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so as I, as I'm, I'm there and the chairman of Metro Railways did came you, well, over Did you me. talk about the train in your speech? Uh, no, because that hadn't happened yet. Did because you talk about Ollie wanting to be a train or anything like yeah. that? Yeah, no, no okay. I did say that. I did say, okay. you know, he had always wanted to be a train. 
that was his true wish. He did get to be a train driver and I had talked about that in the speech. Well then Metro Railways the chairman came up to me and he said, well, Debbie, we have a surprise for you and your family tonight. And I had no idea that this was happening. And I said, you know, and I just looked and I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, uh, we've, we came to learn about Ollie's true wish to actually be a train. Oh, I'm going to get emotional now. And uh, behind me were these huge, magnificent, uh, like red drapes, which I kind of didn't really notice before, but they were right behind me. And um, he said, he said, if you turn around uh, tonight, we're going to make Ollie's wish come true. And so these, uh, the drapes fell down and it was platform number seven. And it was, uh, it was an engine. They actually had a brand new engine sitting on the railway tracks with Oliver's name written on the side. So, um, so they revealed his engine at the make at the end of my speech, which I, you know, I had no clue of. I mean, I was, I couldn't believe it. I was in absolute shock. How uh, would anyone be able to tell you to talk for 19 minutes, <laughs> 25 seconds? And then, I mean, what a, what a highlight uh, of their whole entire effort, right? It was, it was just, it was just amazing. I mean, the whole, the, the night was just elected. There was just this amazing energy around the whole, the whole night was just fueled with all this amazing energy and love and light and everything. And it was just, it was just, incredible. I'll never forget it. Um, I don't know that I want to stand up and talk in front of 900 people again, but uh, it, it was uh, unbelievable. And so, so that essentially finished the book. Yeah, uh, the story. I was, yeah, that's the story. Let's Continue take a break and we'll come back. Let's take a quick break. Uh, the okay. book is called Ollie Tibbles, The Boy Who Became a Train. We're back and talking with Debbie Tibbles. She's the author of Ollie Tibbles, The Boy Who Became a Train. It's the story of her son, his battle with cancer, and the loss of his life 16 years ago. The book came about after a fabulous speech she gave at the Make-A-Wish Grand Ball, and Ollie did become a train. And uh, we're gonna share more about, Debbie, um, how you have now, you've written this book, you have the ending to your story by them making Ollie a train there okay. in, um, in it, it, where is it at, the train? Uh, actually, it's it's in Chicago Union Station. It actually runs on the Aurora line daily, ferrying passengers up and down. Um, so, uh, for those that are who are familiar with Thomas the Tank Engine, he's being a very useful engine. He's every still day. in service. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> yeah. so you, this now is the end of the book that you were writing, but nowhere near the end of the story. Obviously, you'll you'll take the story throughout your whole life. It's part of your story. It's part of right. every part of you. So how does a person, for people who are watching, who've lost a child or lost a loved one close to them, you know, that, that might be the book's ending, but then how do you go on with the rest of your story and how you've honored him and his life with the book and with sharing his story? But then there's these quiet moments that are just grueling because now you got to figure out how to live the rest of your life without him. Yeah. How was, how, how was that? How was that after finishing the book and having these big moments that Ollie would have been so proud of? And then there are also these more difficult moments that you've had to navigate. Well, you know, I think it's, uh, you, you walk this path of grief that it, it becomes a part of your life. Um, I know you know this, and it does, it becomes a part of your life in, in, in good ways and in bad ways. And I think that the, I can only attest for myself because I have discovered that grief is so different when the loss of a child, uh, when a parent loses a child, um, and I've met, unfortunately, many parents who have lost a child, um, everyone reacts in so many different ways. And uh, grief is, is kind of sneaky like that. You know, there's no... They talk about the seven stages or whatever that is, but really that's just a bunch of BS because uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna handle it in your own way, and I feel that I think the the one thing that I have learned and it's still ongoing, obviously because it just becomes part of your life. Um, I think you're just being real and being honest with yourself and allowing yourself this process. I call it the cleansing process for me. 
uh, when those days come that are dark, uh, they still knock on my door um, here and there. I never know when, you know, that's how good it is. And it could be something like a kid walking past with the same shoes or, or, um, or in the middle of a store and a, a song will come on that is like, for instance, I did the, um, you know, the Eric and Kathy show. I used to do that fundraiser. I have, and Ollie's story is part of that fundraising event and the song Fix You is, was his song, his story song. And so whenever I hear the song Fix You, um, you know, I can be reduced to I love, to, that to, I love uh, that. Yeah, yeah, well that was his song. And so when I hear that song, in fact, I've only recently been able to listen to it without breaking down, it only took 16 years. Yeah. Um, so, so- an interesting thing too. I think when people think about, um, you know, when, when you've lost someone in your life and some of what you do in your work focuses on that loss, like it did with you, mm -hmm. does with my, yeah. what I've said to people who've asked is it's like this, when the waves of grief come mm -hmm. really overwhelming because oh, you never yeah. felt anything like it before. And it seems like it's going to last that feeling that is going to last for, for the rest of your life. And then Sometimes I, it feels like, you know, you're just swimming against the current and getting thrown against the rocks Yeah. in these waves of grief. And then other times you can kind of lay on your back and float and feel yes. the sun on your face and mm -hmm. have the calm moments because then when the grief crashes into you again, you mm -hmm. recognize it. And for me, yeah. that, like I started to recognize, it. oh, it comes and it goes. Yes. And you, you kind of re re-energize yourself in those moments when you know i haven't lost a child so i'm not comparing you, grief comparisons you get into all kinds of messes when you try to do that i'm only saying that when you lose someone who's such a huge part of your life mm -hmm. you don't know how to feel and then you get really scared by the big crashes of waves and then you start to oh, yeah. say, well there there are these the, there are these parts of calm yeah and it's you know and it's very easy to spin out of control uh, I did. I mean, I, I, I span right out of control, actually. And, and it doesn't matter. It didn't matter. I'm not proud to say this, but it's just I'm just being truthful. Um, it didn't matter that I had two other children, um, you know, I, it, it's, and they needed me. You know, I wasn't always there for them as a mother. Um, this that's just a whole other element of, of loss when 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 life still goes on you know i had other children uh you know i still had to go to the shops you know you still have to do things the grief analogy is is entirely accurate and i mean it's now it's it's become more it's it's kind of developed into this where now this process has become where i have all the, i have much better relationships with people my perception on life has changed you know there's so much positive to see even coming out of this dark side um, I know I never thought that I would say that, but my life has become enriched um, in ways I never could possibly have imagined ever. Um, and I, it's very rare. I still have some sad occasions, but it's it's not very rare. There's more joy and grateful that I had this beautiful boy for seven years. I mean, he's still with me. That's never going to go away. Um, but he has changed my life in ways that can only be for the better. So I'm eternally grateful for that. And you now have a, you'd mentioned before, you have a really strong relationship with your other two children. Well, and that's, that's one of the, I mean, that's just such a blessing. Um, you know, I was not a good mother at the time of, um, my son's passing. Um, I was just very lost in my own dark world and, you know, my, my children were dealing with their own grief. Uh, you know, to lose a sibling. Um, it's, it's so, it's been challenging in lots of different ways. And yet at the same time, we've all grown together. Uh, I have my, I, I mean, we have very open, honest relationships. Uh, I'm so close to my children. And that is just 
the, the best thing that a, a mother, a parent could ever hope for is just to have this wonderful, honest and open relationship with your children. So I'm blessed about, you know, with that and, and with all my relationships, you know, it causes you to rethink about what's important, you know, and you kind of don't care if, even if it means you might offend somebody because sometimes, you know, you have to say things, they need to be said, you know, and you find that you're not hiding behind that mask anymore. You just want to rip it off and just be like, Hey, this is how it is. This is how I feel about you. And whether you like it or not, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> well, let's take a break because one of the things that I love about you is um, just your positivity. And you posted, reposted a video the other day on Facebook of you going around with a banana in a grocery store. <laughs> we'll come back and talk about that in just a second. I'm back with Debbie Tibbles. She's uh, the author of a book called Ollie Tibbles, The Boy Who Became a Train. I highly recommend it. You, one of the things I noticed, we're going to show it, we're going to leave the show showing the video of you with um, the banana in the grocery store. So people will see that. And it just will really show your personality and your positivity and how you help people smile all over the place everywhere you go. You've recently transformed yourself. You and I have talked privately before how you, when you're out of uh, sorts with your health and your weight, everything else kind of starts to crumble. But yes, you're stronger than ever right now. You look fabulous and you've been sharing your journey a bit on Facebook. Yes, I have. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, you know, I mean, peaks and troughs. Uh, I just know that whenever I actually always joke about the fact that when my son died, I was in the best shape of my life because I took up boxing and I got really good at it. Um, but yeah, exercise has always been my go to every time. Um, I don't know why it just, it just, uh, motivates me. Um, I, the endorphins, whatever. I mean, I am a personal trainer. I've been in the fitness industry for 30 years, but it just always puts me back on track, you know, even when I'm feeling really, ah, you know, so, um, it saves me every time. Absolutely. It does. And, uh, with COVID recently and being quarantined, I gained 23 pounds because I was not doing anything. And I was kind of depressed. I think a lot of people, were as well um so yeah i've i've been back at it yes i know i uh i was doing pretty good uh, i took up kickboxing last year hey it's, awesome <laughs> it's the one thing that i have, have like i i went monday through thursday no matter what i loved it. it my body changed my attitude changed and then covid right and i did personal training so it's very different i can't just punch a bag i was used to punching his gloves and and we'll get back to that but uh, to be able to do that. But I gained some weight during my birthday month, <laughs> which is remember I was doing pretty good till then. So yeah, to my green smoothies and intermittent fasting and pulling myself together and, and walking on my desk treadmill while I work that I have right there. But I just wanted to share your story because it, we're never done evolving. We're no. never done improving. We're never done hitting some of the lowest points in our life and then coming back up from that. And you're just the shining example of what that looks like. So thank you for coming and sharing that with all of us. And we're going to show that video of you in the grocery store. <laughs> I love that video. I just, it was so fun to do. <laughs> you, just, uh, you just had an idea to do it and you did it and it was spontaneous. And that's some of the best stuff yeah. that any of us can do is when we don't plan it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It was, it was such a laugh. Yeah. I, I loved it. It was so great. And, and you know, right now it, we need that kind of thing more than ever, you know, even that, we take it for granted. We can't even do that right now. Yeah. So, that's yeah. Why I think so you know, this, this video was taped years ago and long before COVID and the limitations in grocery stores. So thank yeah. you for being here. Again, oh, the book great. is Ollie Tibbles, The Boy Who Became a Train. And I will see you when the tour resumes, when it's rescheduled. And I will see you during the stop in Chicago. You and John oh. and I will, will have a, a nice meal and a toast. That will be marvelous. I'll so look forward to that. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. I'll see you, you. soon. Take you care. Too. Lots of love. Mwah. <laughs> you too. Mwah. <laughs> I love talking to people. I love meeting new people. So I thought I'd conduct an experiment this afternoon. And we're going to see how many people actually smile back and take the time to say hello. So let's take a walk down the aisle and see what happens. Hey. <laughs> Good time. I've 
having a great time. Now, this is my microphone. You're talking to the camera there. What we're doing, we're doing a, we're conducting a little experiment. You look very silly. Tempt, I look very silly, do I? Well, that's like you do a banana. <laughs> it's my microphone. But, well, we're conducting the experiment to just, you know, saying hello to people. You know, people you don't know. I don't think we do enough of that these days. No, do we don't. We don't. Do I we? always walk by somebody and I always say hi. Yeah, well, good for you, you know, because that's what life's about, connecting and sharing kind of things. And when it's nice to meet you. So there you go. People do like to talk. People like somebody who can't say hello to me because they do think they look silly with an arm. However, I think that's it. I don't think we have enough people.